morning, everyone, and welcome to Hope Church here in Lavernia, Texas. We're so happy that you joined us, and I'm looking around, and the parking lot is filling up. Thank you for uh, uh, adjusting with the time. Uh, today we're meeting at 9 a.m. and about to kick off in some praise and worship. And remember, we're gathered together. We may not be inside of a four walls in a building and sitting side by side, but we are here together, and we're worshiping the Lord. I can see you. You can see me. But most importantly, the Lord can see you. What kind of passionate desire do you have today to be in his presence? Could you just believe with me today that your, your car, your car, your truck, whatever vehicle you have driven here in can be filled full of the glory of God. May his spirit today just overwhelm us with his presence. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you today. We give you glory. We give you honor. Hallelujah. This is your day, Lord Jesus, and we've come to rejoice in it. We glorify your name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Put your hands together and let's worship the Lord. Lord, come have your 
Great. 
sacrifice was made and I believe today that through the prayers of faith that is being offered up around this property in Jesus name you'll be healed so Lord hear our prayer today hear our prayer of agreement today hear our prayer of faith today hear our prayer Lord Jesus hallelujah that the gifts of healing would be manifested in this place that not one person that drove into this parking lot with the ailment with a affliction with a pain with a sickness 
Lord, they're leaving out the same as they came in. Yeah. Lord, we believe that, Lord, the witness of your word is already being made known unto them. Those that are watching at a distance, Lord, this morning, whether it be in Midland, whether it be in Vietnam, whether it be in Japan today, thank you for those that are watching around the world or as close by as someone, Lord, that is right here in Laverne. Lord, watching online, that they too would be touched by your word. Your word be healed. Be healed. Can we just give him thanks? Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you. Thank you for the healing that you provide. Glory to your holy name. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for you wonderful folks that have come to lead us in worship today. Thank you for those that are here that have joined in worship and those that are watching and worshiping with us. As we transition to the reading of God's word and the preaching of this message today that we've entitled Defend the Crown, a continuation of the message on the book of Revelation as we began several weeks ago. There are several things that I need to make known to you today. Uh, one, I need to uh, remind you that this is the day that we celebrate those that have accomplished uh, the completion of their their school and uh, are graduating this year. Amen. Come on. For Levi Martinez, for George Jimenez, for Tommy Criado, those that have been a part of our church. Come on, we celebrate them today. Thank you all. Amen. Hallelujah. Congratulations. Amazing. Amazing. There are others that are that are celebrating graduations in the most unusual of ways in 2020, and uh, we do not we do not take away from any of your accomplishments. But we want you to know that this is a special time in your life and in your family's life. We celebrate with the parents. Uh, we celebrate with the family and the teachers and administration, all of those that are involved to make this day possible. We know that in the coming days that there will be, uh, uh, I would just call it unique ways of uh, schools doing uh, their graduations. And we want to just thank you for those that have come out and celebrated today with these three fine graduates. Uh, we have made available in person a table uh, that as you leave out, many of you have brought cards to uh, celebrate and to bless them. And we want you to be able to do that today. If you are unable to do that in person today, you can do that through all the uh, uh, ways that you give and return your tithe and make that known uh, by just putting in the note or the memo that these are for the graduates and, uh, and uh, for them today we celebrate. I also want to just uh, remind you in that same uh, in that same mindset that we are continuing to receive uh, your tithe uh, that has not ceased. Though we have been quarantined, we have continued the ministry, and we are continuing to keep the doors of the storehouse open, and the Bible has given us clear uh, instruction that we are to return our tithe into the storehouse, and so we have made that available to you in many ways. Uh, those of you that are here in person can do that as we have been in front of the church office as you leave out in a safe uh, way, and also uh, for those that are online and those that are watching, you can continue to do so through the uh, technical devices and, and uh, uh, we'll make that available to you. This is uh, the first Sunday of the month, so we just celebrate uh, and thank the Lord that we have that to return. Amen? Amen. How many of you are thankful? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I also want to keep you uh, in uh, remembrance of the, uh, the uh, activities that are going on throughout the week. Uh, we have a a handout that we make sure that are handed out and again in a safe way as you uh, come in so that you can make notice of those uh, on our website through our Facebook page there are other ways that you can view and see what's coming up I think Pastor Stephanie has uh, been uh, instrumental and uh, not just uh, in, the, in the planning of but the implementation of the family uh, fun nights and so as those are coming and the details are coming just go to those uh, Facebook page, uh, go to the website, find out, pay attention to those texts and those uh, emails that come your way because we want you to be a participant. We want you to be a part of it as we engage in community here in the church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Many of you have asked, Pastor, when are we going to go inside the building? I'm going to give you the short answer. 
when the Lord tells me to. I can stand, amen, I could stand here all day long as I was in a, uh, uh, just a, uh, a Zoom meeting this past week with our Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick, and uh, there were over 750, I believe 780-ish uh, pastors that were on that same uh, Zoom uh, conference uh, uh, meeting this past week. Uh, it was all about the reopening of Texas, the reopening of uh, small business and, uh, and uh, restaurants and things that in which we have uh, so missed and also included in that most importantly that particular meeting was our churches and uh, we talked about it in length. I know that there are many church doors that are opening up and people are going inside the building. There are many uh, regulations, guidelines, restrictions, suggestions that are being asked of the church and uh, those that are uh, reopening their businesses and many of those we feel comfortable with and many of those we're just unable to meet at this time and, and the Lord has said why do you need to change something that I haven't given you a uh, word to change at this moment and I said amen because Dan Patrick was asked how do you know when your church is ready and that was his response to that pastor he goes I'm not a pastor but I think you should just talk to God first it will be second and so I thank the Lord for our leadership uh, not just on the state level, uh, but in our local community. I thank the Lord for Robert Gregory, our mayor, uh, our, our Judge Jackson in our county. Thank you. Thank you for our president, uh, Donald Trump. We pray for this. We know that the decisions are weighty, weighty, weighty upon them. And uh, here's what I know. is I trust in the Lord, and it's all going to be good. Because I put all my trust in Him. And I know that no matter what the end is, that I will be with him for eternity. Because that's been what our message has been. So I'm going to segue right into that message. It's called Defend the Crown. So if you have your Bibles, uh, whether at home or whether here in the parking lot, I pray that you have uh, re-engaged with your Bible. And uh, I want you to go to Revelation chapter 3. We left off finishing with verse 6 last week. We'll begin with verse 7 this week. A little recap for those that are just coming on, and uh, I will, because I want to make known to you and kind of set the set the table uh, so that you can feast with us today on this word. We first investigated the first verses of this chapter and heard the voice of the Lord warning the church of Sardis to awaken. Amen. Can you say awaken? To awaken and get busy, or they would die. You know, this past Friday, we, uh, we, uh, the church, uh, myself, uh, uh, particularly began a, a new Bible study on every on a weekday morning, Monday through Friday, and I'm calling it "We're Burning Daylight," uh, an opportunity for us to awaken each day, but most importantly, for us to awaken as a church to be about the Father's business. I would like to invite you to be a part of that uh, each morning, 7:30, for just a little while. And uh, join us with a cup of coffee or a glass of iced tea or, or water, whatever, or orange juice or breakfast. Just come and join us. If you're traveling, uh, turn us on. Listen to us as you're traveling, heading to work. Uh, we want to be a part of your morning. We're burning daylight, 730. This warning to awaken had a special significance to the congregation of that church of Sardis. Because they remembered the two armies that defeated them because the guards had fallen asleep. They had become careless. Can I remind you that the church, I believe, has become careless. We have been caught up in a lot of tradition. Tomorrow's reading in the Live Dead Joy, in which is the devotion we'll take as we uh, come together in We're Burning Daylight, it talks about that tradition and the caution that we need to be about just doing things because we've just been doing them. Amen. And so the church had fallen asleep because they had carelessly just become content. And they weren't watching, and these two armies came in and defeated them. In the following sermon, then we looked, as Christ noted, that not all the people's uh, garments were soiled. That's a, pro that's a, that's a promising uh, remark, that not everyone was soiled that by the world's pollutants. Uh, his promise was to those overcomers that they will be dressed in white. I'm going to give you a new robe. We talked about that last week as being dressed and wrapped in a robe and they were going to be dressed in white and that and this is this is so important that their names will never be blotted out of the book of life and we took time to talk about the book of life 
And so FYI, I just wanted to remind you that it is our intent to help everyone to be rapture ready. It is our intent for you to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I, I want to be one of those un overcomers. I want to be active. I want to be trusting. I want to have obedient faith in Jesus Christ. And here's, here's my expectation. When the Book of Life is opened up, my name is going to be found on that list. And I want you to know, this is my promise to you and my commitment to the Lord, is I'm not willing to allow anything, I mean anything, anything to be the reason for my name to be removed. So I know that I must be fervent, I must be active, I must be obedient, I must work on my faith. I pray that today that everyone has already been fitted for the robe of white raiment that we have spoken of. But today I want you to know that when we look at our fitting of that robe, that that's not all in which we've been fitted with. So very first thing today, as we step into today's sermon, I want you to know what's in the fitting. What's in the fitting? So let us pray. Lord, we thank you today that as we move into today's uh, uh, just a word that you have given unto me that there would be ear to hear as the instructions were given to these churches to have and that those who have that ear would listen would listen and that they would then begin to respond react and Lord be obedient to the word and that as the church as a whole Lord God regardless of whether we are now moving into the building and I pray for those churches that have today that there would be an anointing that there would be a covering over them for those that are still in the drive in uh, capacity Lord that your anointing would be here those that are just strictly online God I thank you for all the ways Lord God I thank you that in the midst of when the enemy tried to shut the church up that Lord God the church got louder and I I thank you, Lord God, that there has been an awakening of the church today. But I pray that as we move into talking about the church of Philadelphia, that we would know that we are more than just fitted with a robe. But, Lord, you have fit us with a crown. And I give you all the praise. Amen. That's correct. We've not only been promised to be fit with a robe, but we will receive a crown. We will receive a crown. It seems that the armor that is spoken of in chapter 6 of Ephesians, most of you are familiar with that. At the beginning of this uh, uh, pandemic, before we went into a quarantine, as a church, we looked and we addressed the armor of God. And I'm so thankful that as even this week, as I was engaging in conversation with one of our church family members, that they spoke of that that. That's just that armor uh, that we presented in paper form. It was on their refrigerator and that they were repeating it and praying that on a daily basis. I encourage you to do so. Be dressed every day when you go into battle. Don't fight naked. I'm telling you, you need to go into battle every day fully armed from the head to the toe. There's been a provision of armor. But I look at the scripture and I see that one day when the trumpet blasts and when the Lord returns to catch his bride away, that we're going to exchange that dress for that of royalty that that will be will, will we be doomed in for that after that final victory and that victory of faith will be rewarded in glory as we are fitted with not only a robe but a crown and we will wear a crown and I couldn't help but to remember an old hymn that we used to sing on a regular basis it simply was entitled wear a crown may I just repeat to you the course I won't sing it I'm not going to try to hurt your ears today but you might want to sing along with me and when the battle's over we shall wear a crown we shall wear a crown we shall wear a crown and when the battle's over we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem wear a crown wear a crown away over Jordan and when the battle's over we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem anybody recall that song if so let me know here in this parking lot Hallelujah! I am looking forward to that day. Now, I love wearing hats, as you probably have noticed, and I can't wait to exchange my hat for a crown. 
and what an anticipation of celebration. You believe that graduation from the education system of all that hard work that you've been involved in, students, is a celebration. You believe those that have been in the higher education system and have begun to, to look at these ways of, of walking across aisles that are not aisles and stages that are not stages right now in 2020, but you're celebrating graduation moment, but what a glorious graduation on that day that we'll walk in the, in the, glor in the glorious streets of gold and walk and see our Savior who has called us home. Amen. Amen. So as we open this next letter, letter, we see how a faithful and a fruitful church is rewarded. And why are they rewarded? For their obedience by defending the crown. Defending the crown. I want to define the word defend. Defend means to resist an attack made on. It means to protect. It means to shield. It means to be keep secure. Do you, do you recall some of those childhood, uh, uh, you know, those uh, playground? I don't know if they still do it on the playgrounds, and maybe these graduates can remember. We would play games out there on the uh, during a, what we call recess back in the day. <laughs> That's still part of your curriculum? I don't know, but recess, we would play. And there would be games in which we would keep that which was treasured away from other people. We would defend it. Right. We would defend it. So in other words, when I'm saying we're defending the crown, you have something already that has been given you, and you need to defend it. You don't need to let anyone take it away. But, but this is the, the warning I give to the church today. Most often, it is not somebody taking it away, but that we're giving it away. So be careful this morning. But I do remind you that there is one who can't physically take it away, but he is trying every way to discourage you and cause you to fail so that you would give up what is rightfully yours, the crown. His name is Satan. John 10.10 10 speaks of it, speaks of him as a thief. A thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. There is nothing good about Satan. There is nothing good about his activity. He is out to make sure you lose. He wants to take your crown. I'm reminded in 1 Peter 5, 8, 9. And I read it from the message. Keep a cool head. Oh, that's important on a day like today. I understand here in Texas, we're going we're gonna to exemplify what Texas is all about. We're going to hit some high numbers of heat. But I'm telling you, the Word of God says keep your cool. Keep your cool. Keep a cool head and stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. Oh, that kind of reminds me of the church of Sardis, who was carelessly sleeping. The devil, he wants to do this. So the scripture says, keep your guard up. You're not the only ones plunged into those hard times. We're not alone in this. I, I know that not everybody's about this phrase, we're in this together, but we're in this together. And the enemy is after all of us, okay? Especially, especially those that are in Christ Jesus. And yeah, Christ yeah. Jesus is in you. Okay? When, when you are full of Christ, he is after you. There is a full onslaught attack against you. He wants you to lose your crown. The last line of this verse says, In the same with Christians all over the world. So stay, so keep a firm grip on your faith. Your crown and your faith are connected, are connected. So firmly keep your faith, and as you keep your faith, you keep your crown. But first, as we continue looking in our fitting, we got to look at what's in the future. i got to take a moment and remind those that the book of Revelation is not intended as just a blueprint for what is going to happen next. There may be some that are listening this morning and some that are watching not only here in the parking lot but around the world and you're asking, when are you going to get to the good juicy stuff of Revelation and tell me when all this is going to happen? You see, in a current culture of few surprises, we are continually checking the data, cross-referencing the projections, and calculating the forecast in an attempt to know what's coming. Doesn't that sound like the, the daily news? Everybody doesn't want to be surprised. They want to know what's going on. The news media does not have all the answers, by the way. So why are you surprised 
when they make a, an announcement or they declare or they, they report something that you may not rightly agree with. They don't have all the news. They just report what they are pro, uh, uh, I want to say procrastinating in, but what they're forecasting. They're making a guess to satisfy what? Yeah. They're making a guess to satisfy the curiosity of the crowd. Of the crowd. Drama is on demand, folks. Only one has all the answers, and he has it all under control. People create chaos, but my God communicates hope, the blessed hope. And I'm here today to declare that blessed hope to the church. This revelation, or this apocalypse, which is also known as, is not a play-by-play -play account, but a letter to his servants. Uh, literally the slaves, the the uh, the bond servants, uh, those who are committed, those true believers who belong to Jesus and are fully committed to serving and following him. And he gave this letter to them to show the things which must come to pass. It's the age-old question which is not to be the question. Matthew 24 is a great chapter to recall and to read as even those in the day in which Christ walked on the earth are asking questions, when is this going to happen? Right. You notice how Jesus then shifts it because we always want to ask the wrong question. He says there are some things that are, and I'll remind you that there are some things that are under the Father's authority and have not been or will not be revealed. He won't reveal everything before they happen. Acts 1 7 says, and he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Some things are introduced from the point of view of heaven and some from the point of view of earth, with an anticipation of more details following. He's not going to give us all the answers up front. I just personally don't think we can handle all of them. Yes, the book is filled with contrast of the book of Revelation, which distinguishes the characters and symbols. But they all look ahead to the triumph of our God and of his Christ when he returns to catch his bride away. And this is a good place for me just to insert, since we're talking about defending the crown, that Jesus first wore a crown of thorns so that we might wear a victor's crown in glory. I want to introduce to you a word that I'll probably uh, expound on a little bit more as the days come. But this is about be, being a pre-tribulist. In other words, we believe, there are those who believe in pre-trib, uh, mid-trib, and post-trib. If you haven't been around the church for all, you haven't heard these phrases. And I've come to understand that they have been ebbed and flowed and changed and, <laughs> and kind of massaged. And, and, and there are so many different ways to describe this. But I want you today to look with me on those who believe in the pre-tribulation of the saints. They view the book of Revelation as almost everything after Revelation 4 as being fulfilled in a seven-year period at the end of the church age. I do think that this is very important for you and I to take notice of and, us, and to read personally. Don't just listen to all the viewpoints that are out there in the world, but I want you to read personally. Because you need to know that when you start shouting from the mountaintops that these things are happening, so this means that Jesus is coming tomorrow, there are some things that need to align with the Scripture. And there is coming a seven-year period at the end of the church age that is a period of tribulation, wrath, and judgment that will climax with Christ's physical return in glory to destroy the armies of two of, of one particular person that you may know of. His name is the Antichrist, and no, I don't know his name as of right now. And there's going to be an establishment of Christ for his millennial, which is a thousand year reign on earth. These create some curiosity in you? Good. Go read the book. You see, I mentioned the reason I mentioned pre-tribulation is because that would include me. But we as pre-tribs have also been guilty of a great deal of speculation in the interpretation of the book. You see, some have set dates and tried to figure out what's going to happen next and try to identify the Antichrist. 
This all just leads to criticism by unbelievers. And we're not here to try to create the chaos that is already being created by those who want to create that mass media, if you would. We're here to help bring an expectation of the coming of the Lord Jesus. So don't try to bring more chaos and confusion to the matter in which the Lord is speaking of in these letters to the church. We want the unbeliever to become a believer. We want everyone's name to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We want everyone to be fitted for both a robe and a crown. We want everyone to be anticipating that day of Christ's return. Whether he comes with a trumpet blast and we all get to take a flight without a ticket, bought in an airline's terminal, or whether we go by the way of the grave. There's a promise that Jesus is coming very soon. And there's a charge for the church to be fruitful. Fruitful. It's one thing to be a tree that's alive, that's out here on the ground, taking great space up with roots down deep. But if that tree has no fruit coming off of it, what good is it? And we're fruitful only by the spreading of the gospel to every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. This is inside my spirit. It's now deep inside my soul. I want you to know that everyone needs to hear the gospel. Everyone. And that is going to be the key that opens up those portals of heaven for the Father to say, Son, go get them. As everyone having that privilege. And in this letter to the church of Philadelphia, we discover that they are the fruitful church to the end of the church age. So we always have to look to the book, God's Holy Word, the Bible, to see what all of this means. You can't find it in the book. You're looking in the wrong place. Man. So what does it say regarding the faithful? What does it say to regarding those who are the defenders of the crown? You may have heard me say it in this manner over the last few weeks, the overcomers. What is, what is the promise to the church who remains obedient and faithful witness to Christ and the gospel? Have you ever thought that, considered that? What does the overcomer, the defenders of the crown, receive in the final hour? So what's in the faithfulness? We're taking a step back and look what's in the future, but what's in the faithfulness? Before you leave today, I want you to take hold that we must defend our crown. And to defend our crown, we need to persevere in faith and be faithful. We need to persevere in faith and be faithful. You're going to endure some hard times. You're going to endure some troubles. There's going to be some suffering. The scripture has been very clear about that. You need to be prepared today for what's coming. Well, Pastor, haven't we already gone through some of that? I don't believe that we have tasted anything yet. And if this has been a bothersome to you and this has been very difficult for you, then you have not come into these days prepared for what's coming tomorrow. That's not a prophetic word, but I do believe that it's coming to pass, and it is true. There is a promise that is given to the church that is faithful. I want you to hear it as I read it from the voice, interpretation of the scriptures in Revelation 3. Right there in the middle of that verse, it says, I will protect you from the time of trial. I will protect you from the time of trial, that of suffering, that of which is coming upon the people of the land the whole earth, and I will put everyone to the test. I know that those who are graduating, you're celebrating, you may be in your mind thinking, praise God, I don't have any more tests to take. Every day we awaken and our eyes open, there's a test. Yeah. I'm telling you, there's a test while we're sleeping. There's a test. The Lord God has tested us because He needs us to be ready. Because when He doesn't know the day in which He's going to return, only the Father knows that day and hour. And so we need to be ready at all, all times so that when He comes, He is not catching us unaware. Not like the church of Sardis, but we are ready. We're much like the church of Philadelphia. The entirety of that scripture cannot be unnoticed because you have obeyed my instructions. You have obeyed to endure and be patient. How many of you love that word, patient? I will protect you from the time of trial that will come upon the whole earth and put everyone to the test. I will return soon, Jesus is saying. Hold tight to what you have so that no one 
can take away your victor's wreath. You know what that is? That's your crown. The Lord is telling you to defend your crown. Don't let anybody take it away. Hold on tight. Endure. And how do you do that? You become faithful. Revelations 3, 7 through 10, I told you, is the entirety of our text. It is the story of the church of Philadelphia. That same angel that writ, had wrote to the other churches wrote to the Philadelphia. It said, These say, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. I want you to know, as I take it and read it from another translation, this is important for you to know. He goes, write down my words and send them to the messenger of the church of Philadelphia. These are the words of the Holy One. The one, the true one, the one who possesses the key of David, which opens, listen, the possibilities so that no one can shut them. The one who closes all options so that no one can open. I want you to hear this as we continue this message on defending the crown. That this is a this is a, a title of God, if you would. As this letter to the to the seven of churches of Asia come, and it comes particularly to this one that is known as the brotherly love. It was not it was a, the most nearly perfect, but not receiving any criticism from the Lord. Jesus took time to draw their attention to His holiness and to identify Himself as the Holy One. Jesus is always reminding us of who He is. Partly because we tend to get careless in remembering who He is. The scripture in the Revelation says He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He changes not. Don't get so comfortable and content with the way you have been doing church. This may not have been all that bad of a deal. To get the church shaken up, to awaken us, to have us to do things in ways that we never even envisioned. And to find out that it is possible that you can have church just when two or three gather. Because that's what the scripture says. But he wants you to know that he, by the virtue of this office or possession, indicates that he has the authority to admit and to exclude. In light of this verse 8 and that of chapter 3 verse 12, this may refer particularly to that of the new Jerusalem. Even as we look forward into chapter 21 of Revelation. Jesus does what no one else can do in opening and shutting doors. And when he does so, no one can reverse. There's a prime example in the Old Testament as we look at, at those who were shut in to the, uh, to the ark. Another day in which warning. Another day in which there was declaration and a voice that was being shouted. Can you just see oh Noah standing out on that construction uh, platform of that ark? Shouting out to those masses, crowds of people who are mocking him. Who are telling him to be quiet. You're too loud. Go back inside that ark. Go back inside those walls. Keep that noise to yourself. But he's shouting out and said, you need to get right. You need to get on board with us. Literally, get on board with us. For this is the only ship that will, set, that will sail. This is the only one that's going to be afloat that you will be saved in. And we know that on that day in which the rains began to come down, that those that were, were right in that family of Noah went on to that boat. And that door was shut and no one could open it. He still has that same authority. He has that same authority on that day in which the heavens will open and here will be those that will be in, in ushered in because they are ready. They are faithful. They are as the church of Philadelphia. They've been found in obedience and faithful to the things of God. They're going to come into glory. Once that door is closed, it won't be opened again. Now is the day of salvation. Right now. Not tomorrow. Don't wait. Don't delay. No excuse. If you've got family members that are not right with the Lord, today is the day that you need to be bold. Yeah. You need to be bold. Well, they may not like me anymore. I tell you what, once they have Jesus in their heart, that love will be a lot stronger than the like that you are looking for. And that appreciation you want today. I'm telling you that Jesus is calling for us to make things right and make people ready. 
But I believe also, as many others do, that until that day of Christ's return, that this authority he has to open doors that were once shut, and will open those doors wide open, and to close doors that were once open, is that which we can see in the world of missions. May I repeat to you until every tongue, tribe, and nation know that Jesus is, that we need to be proclaiming the gospel all around the world. That is why even during the pandemic, we are supporting our missionaries. We are praying for our missionaries. And missionaries are still being sent and going into the far corners of the world because everyone needs an opportunity to hear about Jesus. Final days prior to the rapture of the church, we're going to see miraculous opportunities that were once unavailable. They were unopened. I'm seeing the social media open up so that the gospel can be proclaimed. I'm seeing all other avenues and opportunities, doors that are being opened, as in doing church in a parking lot, so that we can seize these opportunities and be faithful and obedient to proclaiming the word of God. Christ, the gospel needs to be presented. Listen. Fruitfulness, faithfulness to walk through doors that are opened by the Lord Jesus results in fruitfulness. But hear my call to you today, but unfaithfulness will cost you the crown. Defend the crown. Seize the opportunities of open doors. Be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ being presented. The last thing I want to bring to you, because we're not going to be able to get the entirety of this message in one service. Too much. Verse 8, he says, I know your deeds. There's nothing hidden from the Lord Jesus. He knows Amen. everything you've done and everything you've not done. Amen. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door which no one can shut. I have done this because you have limited strength. Yet you have obeyed my word and have not denied my name. This church in Philadelphia was once, who was a true church, faithful church to the word of God. It, is an indi there, it has been indicated that they were a small church, a small gathering of people. I'm looking in this parking lot, and I know that on the Facebook Live, there's a small contingency of those who faithfully watch from beginning to end. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for making those comments and letting us know you're out there. If you're new to with us today, let us know where you're from, who you, who you, uh, who, who put you in contact with us. We want to know these things. We pray for you, but I want you to know we're not very large. We're not very large. We have little strength, but as the church of Philadelphia, we remain faithful from a worldly power. That means from the world's point of view, the church of Philadelphia was weak. But in the point of view of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of their faithfulness and their commitment to the word of God, they had much spiritual power. Since they were obedient and did not, did not disown Jesus. Clarence Larkin goes on in his study to describe that this was as that a revived church of Sardis. Not only were they a small church, but they were weak because they were like a dead church that had been revived and they hadn't fully received all their strength. I believe the church is right there and we are in need of a revival in these days that have come ahead of us. Both interpretations give us a strong indication that this church was more powerful because of their faithfulness. Without faith, you are weak. It doesn't matter how many you are. It doesn't matter how physically strong you are. Without faith, you are weak. Because it's not because of our physical condition. It's because of our spiritual condition. Too many people are overestimating their spirituality. Too many churches are overestimating their spirituality. They're evangelistically speaking about their success in the Lord. I'm blessed by the Lord. I'm favored by the Lord. Look at the things that I've done for the Lord. I think it's sometimes we just need to shut up and let the Lord bring those rewards. And let us just be faithful. The Lord's not looking for people who are strong. He's looking for those who will humbly say and admit, I am weak without you, Lord. I need you. 
That word strength is used especially of divine, miracle-working power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And just because they were of little power, they remained faithful and obedient, maintaining a witness to Christ in the gospel. They defended their crown. They stayed true to the name of Jesus. So I conclude that this church in Philadelphia has been labeled by many as a missionary church, by many as a serving church, by many as a live church. But I believe it was a church that was committed to defending their crown. It was a church that obeyed the word of the Lord in witness becoming fruitful for the kingdom of God. They were faithful. They were not wavering. They did not get pushed around. They did not get careless. They stayed faithful no matter what circumstance, situation, or conditions that surrounded them. I'm asking you today, what are you doing to be fruitful? Are you just waiting out this pandemic? Are you just sitting back waiting until this quarantine is over? Are you just sitting back waiting for the church doors to open so that you can re-engage in the normalcy of what once was? I'm telling you, it won't be like it once was. It can't be like what it once was. We've got to be dependent upon the Lord and fruitful. Listen, I was told the other day that I quite possibly was classified as irresponsible. That news media was telling me because of all the guidelines, and if you were to not follow one of them to the T, you would be irresponsible. I took, a, I took exception to that. Because I believe that we all can be guilty, including those who were calling me and you and others around America irresponsible for actions because I believe that we're responsible for actions even in the church. So let me say this and say it clear. To be unfaithful to the Lord is both irresponsible and negligent. There is no excuse for you to be unfaithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must defend the crown by remaining faithful to the things of God. It can be seen in the simple practices and disciplines of our commitment to the Lord. There are some things that are in Scripture and you can't see the words, if you don't do this, I'm taking your name out. That's not what we read last week. But we read to be faithful. And I believe some of these practices are given to us as a church so that we can show our faithfulness. And this is a good test. So hear me. And are you a student of the Bible? A student is one who studies the Bible, not just reads it, not just listens to it, but you begin to sit down with Jesus. You have some abiding time with the Lord Jesus. You don't use the excuse, I don't have time. I think you've had all the time in the world. You've been quarantined. You can't go nowhere. You can't use the excuses that you did. Number two. Is prayer more than just a religious activity? I prayed today. I prayed for my meals. I prayed, I prayed for the church. I prayed for people. I did it because it's what I'm supposed to do. No. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. Is it the activity of life just as breathing is? Are you faithful to pray? Are gatherings just for convenience only? I'm closing up because I know some of you start to get a little warm. And I'm so thankful for those that are on Facebook and staying with us each week and following us for the entirety of the message. Thank you. But it's not just about convenience. Do you tithe regardless? I know you hate to hear the word tithe, but it is a practice. It's a discipline of whether or not you trust the Lord or whether you're faithful. Do you know that the majority of pastors would just simply tell you that most people do not tithe unless they are on or in the premises of the building? 
Thank you that we have people in our church that regardless of whether you're on Facebook Live or you go on vacation or wherever you might be, you still tithe. Thank you for doing that. You're faithful. Thank you for your faithfulness. And my last question, is the Lord there for you or are you there for the Lord? Are you asking the Lord to be faithful to you or are you telling the Lord I'm going to be faithful to you? So here's the, here's the, here's what changes everything. Repentance. If you haven't been faithful, and here's my concern, is that one of us, the weakest one in the bunch is faithful. That's how we all are. I know I don't like it as well. I would like for us all to be independently responsible. And we are for our own personal soul. But as the church body, as the children of Israel was, we need to be concerned about the weakest in faith in our congregation, in our community, in our surrounding region. And you need to pray and you need to be you need to be fervent about the gospel to them. If you haven't been faithful in the little things of God, how can you be rewarded in heaven? You can't. You can't. Don't lay your crown down for anybody. Be faithful. Repent. 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 Change. Retain. You know what retain means? Keep possession of. Keep possession of your crown. that was promised to the faithful. And most importantly, once you have your crown established and secured, defend it. Remain faithful. Bow your heads. Begin to sing and worship. Follow me if you would. I want you to remain faithful to that. I want you to remain faithful to the Lord. If you need to repent today, I want you to trust that the Lord Jesus will forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of your, this unrighteousness. Say, Lord, I've let little things keep me up from being faithful. And I'm refusing to let anything get in the way of my faithfulness today. I look for you, Lord God, to not just be the Lord of my life, but be the Lord of my eternity. Hallelujah. As they sing this song, I pray that you're making a personal altar to the Lord Jesus today. Right there in your car. If you need to turn your engine on and enjoy some AC, do it. But I want you right now to get shut in. Get quarantined with the Lord Jesus for a few moments. And enjoy His presence. Let Him restore the passion and the fervency and the desire of faithfulness in you. The crown that was promised you is dependent upon your faithfulness. Hallelujah. If you're at home, thank you for being with us. And would you today, would you would you retain the crown? Would you retain that, that sense of faithfulness in your life? I know many of you are watching or part of our church family and unable to be here. Thank you for being faithful on Facebook. Thank you for being faithful in the little things. And we know that you're there. And we're praying that today, in the in, in whatever confines, in whatever days that are ahead, find a way to be faithful as we are asking those in this setting of this cars to be faithful to the Lord, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be fervent in those things. If you're new with us, we love you. We appreciate you. We want you to come to know the Lord Jesus who has been faithful already and shown us that in the sacrifice made on the cross. If you don't know Jesus today, would you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. I trust that you are the resurrected Son of God and you have the authority to forgive me, cleanse me, and make me right with you. And the Father, most importantly, right with the Father. And I want to begin my day of faithfulness right now. Thank you for fitting me with a robe and with a crown. And I'm looking forward with anticipation that day of celebration and glory. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget those that are signing out on Facebook just before we click out. Would you let us know? Would you let us know you've been with us today? Amen. Church, 